half of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all of us at Teamwork Arts, we wish you a Merry Christmas and welcome you back to a new session of JLF's Brave New World. Our magazine partner for the series is The Week, journalism with a human touch. Our session today is Into the Wild with Matthias Klum. Matthias Klum in conversation with Janvi Prasad. Matthias Klum's prolific career began with being one of the youngest contributors to National Geographic in the 1990s. Celebrated for his aesthetic photographic language, he has since contributed to multiple articles and cover stories for the magazine and is the co-author of books such as The Human Quest, Prospering Within Planetary Boundaries and Big World Small Planet, Abundance Within Planetary Boundaries. In conversation with writer and activist Janvi Prasad, he discusses his journeys into these different worlds. Matthias Klum is an artist, photographer and film producer. In an artistic way that is entirely his own, he describes and portrays animals, plants and natural and cultural settings in the form of articles, books, films, lectures and exhibitions. Since 1997, Klum has produced multiple articles and 13 cover stories for National Geographic magazine. He has produced 11 documentary films and published 14 books to date. Janvi Prasad is the festival director of Himalayan Echoes, Kumau Festival of Literature and Arts, and a published author on Mahatma Gandhi. She dedicates her time to the conservation and promotion of literature, music, local textiles, local foods, heritage, monuments, environment and wellness in Uttarakhand. She also works as a peace activist in the field of technology and is the co-founder of a spice brand, White Mountain Collectives. All our sessions that have been broadcast till now are available on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jepo Lit Fest JLF. Please do comment by typing it in the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present Into the Wild with Matthias Klum. Over to you. Thank you, Sanjay, for that wonderful introduction for Matthias and myself. Um, so here we are. Matthias is right here with us in rather odd circumstances because we have to e-meet these days rather than meet personally, especially under a forum which is like the Jaipur Literature Festival. But uh, Matthias, the show must go on and yes. uh, let's take it forward from here. So I'm sitting here in Nenital up in the mountains north of India and it is freezing here. It's the peak of winter. Uh, I'm presuming you are in Sweden. Where, where are you exactly? Actually, I'm not. I'm in uh, Spain at the moment. Um, so I'm in between Alicante and Valencia. And it's, uh, it's winter here as well, but it's, uh, it's uh, as always uh, pretty mild. So it's 16 to 18 degrees Celsius sun is shining and it's not very Christmas-like, but very pretty. Oh, that's lucky, lucky you, lucky you. <laughs> and, and tell me, tell me, Matthias, how, how, has, um, how has the pandemic really been for you? For us in India, it, it's really been tough uh, because of the sheer numbers. And um, we all are uh, lucky, the people who have country homes, they've moved up to the mountains or to the beaches and leading mm. their lives uh, peacefully. Uh, leaving the cities for you how has it been uh, it has been tough I mean uh, I have uh, my, my wife's father for example has been very ill uh, and but we are we are fortunate because no really close friends or family members has has been um, uh, you know has died or or had, had huge problems but it is something that affects us all because it's it's definitely a shared dilemma. And uh, as a Swedish citizen, uh, we have had enormous problems uh, in society, uh, increasingly actually. And in Spain, where I'm at, uh, at now, is also has also been very difficult, especially in Barcelona and Madrid, where, where we are right now. It's it's pretty mild, uh, but but still, it can be felt, of course. Sure. 
And what has been your uh, regimen during 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 this pandemic? For me, it was just a, a bit of writing. Uh, actually, a lot of writing. I managed to finish the manuscript of one of my books for Kumau. But for you, how has it been? Did you manage to step out, do some photography, uh, which is your passion? Yeah, well, we have also done some writing. My wife and I, we've worked together in an artist duo, Alexandro Klum, and we've been writing as well, but also been able to yeah step outside and, and do some some work. And it's I think it's a good time to contemplate, even though it's a tough time, as we said, it's a it's a great time to contemplate and in a way, philosophically speaking, look inwards as well as outwards. Um, so uh, I think it has been it has been a big change for us uh, professionally and and also in in, in private uh, life. But I think in a way for the better, I think, and this is a bit controversial to say, uh, perhaps, but with all, with all the respect for all the suffering and all the huge um, challenges that we are facing, I think in a way the, the good thing about it, if there's a good thing, is really the way we can relate to the transience of life and in a way perhaps retire or not to each other and to nature itself. Yes. And where you really come from, uh, which is Sweden, and I've been to Sweden twice, um, it is the land of pure air. It's pristine and it's, I mean, you're, you can't help it but be around nature. Mm. Uh, so that is really your life. In comparison to that, we are in India, which is chaotic and it's got its uh, quiet spaces and and the noise as well. So we really feel feel um, the quiet, the the clean air. Uh, you know, the lakes are the waters are all clean now. The animal habitat is all out, especially where I am. Um, mm. The footfall, I mean, the leopards are all out, um, the pheasants are out, you don't see them. The other day I was sitting by my window ledge and a pine martin just sort of walked oh, by. Oh, wow. Mm, which nice. Is a rarity. Mm. Anyhow, so that's that. But coming to you, uh, Matthias, again, you are um, a renowned uh, photographer. Uh, and uh, I have, in the last two days, just been going through all your work. Uh, tell me exactly how how uh, wildlife photography sort of fell into uh, your domain because from from one one of my researches I, I found out that your you started with being a musician you you were you were drumming away and mm -hmm. and then suddenly the switch happened how did it all fall into place how how did this calling happen well I I think. I think it might be uh, the same as for you. It's it's something that it's a calling. It's a it becomes a passion. And and as, as a young boy, I borrowed my father's camera. He had a very simple camera. It was a mechanical camera with just you set the aperture and the sh you know and the shutter speeds on your own and no autofocus, no electronics really. So, uh, and I said, can I please borrow it? And he said, yes, you, you, you may borrow it if you're careful. And uh, so I went out into the, into the wilds uh, near our summer cabin in Dalarna, Sweden, and I fell in love. I fell in love with the uh, aspect of bringing something back from adventures in nature or just from seeing tiny details, maybe textures, lights, shapes, and sometimes when it worked out photographically, I could bring back that sensation that I felt. And to me that, well, that I, I couldn't dream of a better hobby to begin with, but then a passion for life professionally as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, tell me something, you um, were 29 years old and um, you were in the in the forests in in Borneo, maybe hanging mm -hmm. from some tree, when a wonderful news came uh, about one of your photographs being featured in the front cover. Uh, tell us, tell us about that. Oh yeah, that was that was good fun. Uh, actually, I uh, during the years nineteen ninety five and ninety six uh, feels like a gazillion years ago. I had a fourteen month expedition into the third uh, largest island. Uh, on the planet Borneo in Southeast Asia. 
And um, so I had 1.5 metric tons of equipment, four assistants, and we ventured into, to us, the unknown, uh, to build blinds and hides up in the canopy, these enormous, gigantic dipterocarp trees. And it was on assignment for uh, quite a reputed American magazine called the National Geographic magazine. And that was my first big assignment for them. And I remember a friend of mine uh, at National Geographic gave me a call and he said, Matthias, you owe us a party. And I didn't understand what he was talking about. So I said, what do you mean? Do I owe you a party? What a strange thing to owe someone. I said, you don't understand, Matthias. You owe us a cover party. And then I realized, aha. So <laughs> I had uh, been granted to have my picture from this long assignment on the cover uh, of National Geographic. And to me, that was it was uh, a wonderful dream come true, but it was more importantly uh, a way for me to tell this story that I cherished in my heart about this primordial, beautiful, diverse rainforest on the cover of a magazine that reaches many people. Yeah, tell, t tell us about, about uh, the silver leaf langur. Because back here where I am, every morning on my chestnut trees, <laughs> or chestnut trees, there are langurs, the gray langurs. Yes, yes. But this yeah. one is different. Yeah, this is different. I love your gray langurs as well, and the sound and how they, how they interact, and it, they're incredible. Uh, these are slightly different. They are smaller, and they're called silver leaf monkey, and they are... Um, also interacting in a beautiful way and they are also in this similar way of the gray langur um, you know on top of trees signaling for for predators like leopard and other things so you can hear them far away and if you can read their behavior and you can listen in tune into nature that will give you some shortcuts and sometimes some great experiences and sometimes good pictures as well but I'm so, I, I, it sounds marvelous that you have them right outside your window. That's incredible. They are, they are. That's amazing. I, we have to come and visit you. I hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, coming back. Uh, so you're being very modest about this cover uh, shot. It was the first in your career. But really, I mean, it's not so easy. You spent about 14 months in the forest in Borneo. Yes. So tell us typically what is it to be a, a photographer like your uh, stature uh, and to get that perfect picture when you're in assignment, what does it really take? How much of the mental and the physical uh, toil, uh, concentration, internalizing, getting used to the natural habitat, how, how does that work for you and how, how does it affect you? Well, firstly, I think when you uh, pick your own pro projects, uh, sometimes a magazine like National Geographic might call you and propose an assignment. They think you might be the right photographer because of your skill sets, your photographic language, and the way you tell a story. Uh, or you might, on your own, pitch, as they say, a story where you have... Um, you have dreamt up <laughs> uh, uh, something you wanted to talk about or tell. In this case, it was it came from me because I had I had been to Borneo earlier in my in my life when I was twenty years old and when I was twenty three, and I loved the place and it was such a challenge to to see if I could visualize this this incredible space. And so they gave me this long assignment and. What it really takes, I think, is, is there are many ingredients. Um, you, you, first of all, being a hopefully good photographer, of course, is a <laughs> foundation, but you also need to do a lot of research because if you don't know enough about the place, about the, the creatures you might find, what it sounds like, what it smells like, what you need to prepare yourself, uh, you're not, you don't understand what you're up against, or actually it's not up against, it's what you are with. Because the more you are in tune with the forest, the better you are prepared to listen and open your mind, the, I think the result will be gifts 
from nature. It sounds a bit uh, strange perhaps, but to me, in my experience at least, it has really helped the softer I get, the more open-minded I get, the better it is the result. The, the more forceful I am, the more uh, green, if I may say so, in my energy, the more will-powered I am, it, it's not necessarily that nature will open up and be generous. So uh, it's, there are so many different things. And then you have all the practical things, like if you get 1.5 metric ton of equipment into a forest, how do you go about it? How do you go about having a hot air balloon in the forest? How do you maintain the cameras clean and healthy and yourself? So there's just, just it's like being a chef in a good restaurant, I think. There are many things to, <laughs> to keep in mind. Absolutely, absolutely. Um... Uh, you have a very, uh, you know, a distinct style um, of photography, uh, which has a lot of emotion in it from what I could sense when I was looking at, um, you know, the polar bear uh, with its child, mm -hmm. and with the baby polar bear, and um, with the lion cub and the mother, the lion upside down lion, lion mm -hmm. rather, you have to tell us about that story. That's brilliant. Uh, even even reptiles, I'm not too fond of reptiles, but even your neon green colored reptiles, they have this spark in their eye <laughs> that you really captured. Uh, and some of them are pretty humorous as well. The one which is giving a high five, the iguana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. your pictures do speak, speak a lot. Uh, and especially to children, I would say that they really would speak a lot to, to children. Uh, but tell me, uh, does that, how, how do you bring that, that emotion out of that? How do you capture it? Uh, how do you know which is the right moment? And in some sense, I feel I've heard a couple of your talks as well. You too share that, that wit, that sarcasm, that humor that comes out in your pictures. Mm. And when you talk, you're very expressive with your eyes, you know, your emotions, you, you can mimic the animal in some sense. Uh, so somewhere I feel you, you are a part, you, are, you reflect each other, the subject and the object. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. I think that was a beautiful description of what I tried to achieve. Uh, and when it comes to uh, the, the actual photography sessions, I might have a wish list uh, of things that I would love to have in the bag as I leave an assignment and go back to base camp. But uh, I think when magic happens, it's really in between the checked boxes uh, because the, you might have a preconception. You might be so preconceived when it comes to what picture would be the ideal picture that you miss out of that magic Again, if you're not open enough, because you might want this crystal clear, sharp, perfect um, image of something that you have maybe even seen before. Because as a human being, we are masters of uh, redundancy. We, we all the time, we, it's easy to copy. It's hard to create something new. So I myself, I, I tr really try very hard to check the boxes of the, of the obvious. But I think the best pictures I've ever taken are the ones that end up uh, attracting my attention in between the checked boxes, if you understand what I'm trying to say. And, and that is when magic can happen, when you have uh, a second of, you have, for example, the silver leaf monkey on the cover of National Geographic. I had... Uh, a gazillion photographs of it, crystal clear, sharp, uh, afternoon dead, uh, you know, beautiful light uh, or morning light. But then one, one evening, I had this golden, Asian, wonderful as, you know, this golden light just coming through the canopy. And I had many leaves filtering this incredible face. So it became it became golden. The whole silver leaf monkey became a golden leaf monkey just because of that light. And that was to me the, the essence of my own experience 
what really when I when I feel the smell of Borneo, the Borneo forest, I can look at that photograph and I can get that sensation back. And it's also very personal, of course, but to me that that's what it takes. Wonderful. So in your in all your sort of um, uh, travels, uh, photography, film. Um, which part of the world, and I believe you've gone to more than 100 countries and uh, 40 times to Borneo, which is your favorite, but uh, after Borneo, which, which wild habitat is the most appealing to you? Oh, well, it's hard for me to say mm. that Borneo is the favorite because there, I have so many favorites and I, I think diver I love diversity. And uh, that's a, one reason I really uh, am drawn to India. Uh, because, as you know, of course, <laughs> better than I do, it's it's the subcontinent, the the, the country of of diversity, cultural, religious, uh, biodiversity, all sorts of diversities. So um, I have always loved working in India, and there's you know there's so much so much to see and so much to do, and so I, I and I've also gone for my own strange a uh, roller coaster ride of, of of my life has taken me to just being from the very beginning just doing nature and and wildlife but then in the early 90s i started doing more of people of of uh, ethnic minorities and also uh, relating to climate change and sustainability and to me it's more of today more of a holistic approach than actually necessarily one species or one ecosystem. And so I'm very drawn to the, this more zoomed out vision. Uh, and, and to me, it becomes more relevant as well because we're, well, we're 7.8 billion people on the planet and we're obviously here to stay. So in order for us to live harmoniously together in the future, we need to understand the prerequisites and the well of the, well, the limitations of the planetary boundaries on on this incredible planet uh, and i love to try to work that into my my photography yes um uh, well yes i mean and what you just said reflects a lot in in your compositions uh, be it uh, uh, wildlife be it mammals or birds or even just uh, nature shots uh, and portraits of people it does I think every photograph of yours is so intense and it and it has a deeper meaning and a deeper message uh, to the world that hey listen we are a part of nature so let's just you know blend in rather than just stick out and just uh, kill it all mm -hmm. uh, and we are on that path um, and you have written about 12 to 13 co-authored 12 to 13 books um, on, on, on similar topics uh, to make people aware of where we are. What do you think, um, uh, where are we today in terms of sustainability, uh, environment? Where are we heading? Um, what's, what's the news for the world, really, in your experience and in all, all your travels? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question to, to answer, I think, because it's so, it's such a, it's a, such a, it's a good question. It's super relevant, but it's also a very complicated question. I mean, because there are so many uh, good things uh, uh, at the moment, uh, people working hard, organizations working hard. And for the first time in history, we are uh, this, uh, our, our conversation here, our e-meeting e is, is, uh, is proof of that, is that we are more connected, we can communicate. We are in these days also forced to communicate this way. But it's also an incredible opportunity to uh, spread important information, to share important information. And we have enough science. We have a lot of innovative power. And at the same time, coming back to the 7.8 billion people, we also put unprecedented pressure on our planet, which means that since nature is not responding linearly to our, uh, well, affluent lifestyles, uh, especially in, 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 in many parts of the world, uh, nature is sending invoices, in a way, sending invoices back into our economy. 
which is a, a, a scary situation. And the pandemic that we right now are uh, suffering is, is actually one of those invoices because it's a zoonosis. So when we destabilize nature, when we, when we uh, deforest uh, too aggressively, when we trade with wild animals too aggressively, when we are pushing ecosystems to the brink and we are approach wild animal uh, species with domestic animal species, this is when the zoonosis comes into our world and they are there already, but that's when they come into our world and is sort of unleashed. Uh, so to me, the only safe path ahead is really that we continue very, very hard and very stubbornly to prove that sustainability is not a sacrifice being more increasingly green when it comes to circular economy, etc., it's not a sacrifice. It's truly the only path ahead to safeguard uh, a future for all. Absolutely, absolutely. Tough times, but um, let's see, because with, with the rise of, say, you know, uh, fossil fuels, uh, our own diet, the way we eat, yes. um, you know, all, all those habits have to be changed. And of course, we have to plant as much as we as we can. And mm -hmm. I think where you come from, Sweden, uh, it, it is uh, one of the most uh, eco-friendly um, nations, I would say, uh, in the world, the Scandinavian belt. And um, uh, we must take inspiration uh, from, from that. Um, uh, my next question would be, uh, tell us um, a bit about um, your um, uh, travels to India, a, a little more, throw some more light about your travels, especially to uh, Gir Forest in Gujarat. Yeah. <laughs> How was the yeah. experience uh, with that? Since you worked a lot in Africa with, with the lions, mm -hmm. uh, tell us more about the Gir Forest experiences. Well, the, to a lot of people, and I'm not talking about uh, uh, people in India, because a lot of people in India obviously are aware that the lions of Ashoka, the, the lions of Gir, are uh, very important uh, for, for, uh, for the Indian communities uh, as, as a symbol of power, of, of uh, elegance and royalty in a way. Um, but to most people el elsewhere in the world, uh, people think of tigers if you talk about India or leopards or something else. And you talk, you talk about lions, you think of Africa. So I got this assignment from National Geographic to, uh, for three months, day and night, uh, walk in the Gir Forest with a very, very talented and knowledgeable um, local man. Uh, that really knew his way around this teak uh, forest. And uh, so I, I managed to get, thanks to him and thanks to our collaboration, really, really close to these majestic animals that um, is as, if you're not aware, since this is also an international uh, audience that we hopefully have today, <laughs> you and I, we can also explain that these are not the same lions as in Africa. They are genetically separated from the African lions. So they are separated. And these are the lions of, of our uh, Christian civilization or the Christian belief, uh, the, the Bible actually as well, because during the time of Jesus Christ, these lions roamed from Italy and Greece and through parts of Europe, uh, even, uh, and all the way to uh, Iraq and Iran. And uh, so they have, they look differently as well. They don't have the same big mane as the African cousins. They have big elbow tufts. They have a belly fringe like the now extinct Burberry lion. So anyway, they're just amazing. So I had the great, great privilege of doing a cover story for National Geographic about these uh, just incredible creatures. 
And and the upside down lioness, where was that? <laughs> Will you tell us about that? Yes, yes, yes. That, that was actually lo absolutely lovely. For, uh, as I said, I, I crawled around. I was sneaking around in the Gir uh, National Park for three months, day and night. And then uh, at one point we had gradually habituated a female with her cubs that knew that we weren't hostile and we we could manage to be pretty close to her so she was relaxed comfortable and i could just sit very close to her and work and then again as a gift from nature as a gift from gear and india and the lions she in a beautiful light was she called her cubs she rolled over on her stomach and she put herself in a very vulnerable beautiful position and one of her cubs came up and leaned uh, the cub's little head onto <laughs> his uh, mother's uh, throat in a way. And uh, it just made a beautiful moment. It, was just, it just lasted for a second, but it was enough for me to, to create this cover frame that then, uh, uh, well, told a story about this marvelous, marvelous creature. Beautiful. It's a fantastic shot. It's, it's one of my favorites. Uh, oh, of... <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, um, now coming to more to the technical aspect of, of uh, your profession, really, which is equipment, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you've heard of F, uh, FW uh, Champion. Um, mm -hmm. he, he sort of invented uh, the trip wire uh, mm -hmm. photography. He pioneered that. Uh, while he was posted right here in Nenital, uh, mm -hmm. a contemporary of Jim Corbett. And yes. thanks to him, Jim Corbett took to uh, a shooting from the camera rather than the gun. Mm. Um, so um, that invention happened in the early 1900s. And uh, now I think, of course, with, with uh, digitization, the equipment is much more sort of, um, uh, you know, high tech, uh, mm. easy to uh, operate. A uh, lot of technicalities, of course. Uh, but tell me, is there not not for a, a photographer of your stature, of course, not uh, not a nat, nat geo photographer, but um, in the larger context of the so-called photographers, um, is it somehow the art is somehow diluted with with the, the digital technology coming in, with photoshopping happening all over the place? Um. Well, I, I don't really think so. I, th I think it has um, it has increased. I think the interest for photography in general, uh, and also the fact that people use their cell phones, smartphones, to, to take pictures. I think it has like, exploded, so that people all over the world can actually afford to take pictures. Uh, it doesn't make all of us photographers. Uh, it doesn't mean that the, it's like I'm not a three star Guy Michelin chef, even if I cook every day. So it's the same with photography. You, you can take pictures, but it, it's a different thing being a professional photographer. So I, I don't think it's necessarily has diluted it, but it has created perhaps more layers. Uh, so you have professional photographers and then you have semi-professional photographers and then you have myriad of other people taking pictures and sometimes even an amateur of course and with a smartphone can take a magnificent photograph and even I I'm not a good chef but I sometimes can nail a really good pasta and my kids say dad that was actually very good <laughs> it doesn't make me Paul Bocus so or you know so it's really just I think it's a good thing because it has become very accessible. Uh, mm -hmm. And what is photography? Well, it's, it's something you do to uh, capture memories, moments, mm -hmm. your, your children, your friends, your, your, whatever it is, something you see. And, um, but then when it comes to the field of documentary photography, uh, you came into the, the, the issue of photoshopping. Of course, if you, if you are proud and you become a professional uh, document, documentary, do, documentary photographer, you might not want to, uh, of course, 
change things in a way that will take out your trustworthiness, uh, the authenticity. Because let's say you work for National Geographic and you do that, you're out, you're fired. So it really depends which world you're in and why you take your pictures and for whom. Yeah. So also what, what um, sort of rules, a set of rules uh, or values that have you sort of carved out for yourself while you're at work uh, in the wild really? Because mm -hmm. uh, when I'm going out birding here uh, up in the Himalayas, um, you know, you'll see a bunch of photographers all in their cameos and long lenses and all, but when they'll see a pheasant, a male pheasant, they'll start calling, you know. Mm -hmm. so it's like artificial stimulation mm -hmm. for the bird. Now, well, technically it's wrong, but what's wrong with it? Yeah. <laughs> so um, what, what, what are your do's and don'ts when, when you're out in the wild shooting? Mm. Yeah. Well, that, that is, I think, um, there is different principles, of course. I mean, I, I would, the bottom line is, which should be, completely it should go i mean it should be obvious to each and all that should never ever hurt an animal or uh change things in nature that would uh you know um uh, be hazardous to the health of 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 uh, the living beings that you're there to photograph but but unfortunately, that's not always the case. A lot of people get so stressed and eager to take a photograph that they go around in vehicles and they, they stress and press and put pressure on animals just to get that shot. And to me, that is not okay. However, let's say you, you took the example of the male pheasant. And if you can whistle to get the, way, the pheasant to walk your way, it's it's not as bad perhaps as, as doing many other things. But again, if you have uh, 2000 photographers whistling every day, <laughs> it, can be, it can be pretty confusing. <laughs> it's like, being a, it's like uh, being a beautiful person on the street and you get whistled at every day. <laughs> it's, it's perhaps very stressful too. But uh, no, I, th I think it's, um, I think it has, you have to have to me, it, it becomes very clear. I am there to try to do something good. I'm there to try to elevate the awareness, to show something that is fragile, vulnerable, that needs our human attention to survive. So if I would make it more difficult for that species or for that uh, ecosystem or for that ethnic uh, community of, of minority to lead good lives by being there, I would have failed. So to me, it, there's a code that's pretty firm, uh, but uh, and and that's something that I always try. I strive to do the right thing. How was your experience in Ladakh? Uh, you did a you did a story there in the monasteries of Ladakh, mm -hmm. or what was it like? Oh, I've never been to Ladakh uh, ever. Oh, that you must go. It's uh, whenever uh, that's possible again, but. No, I, I, uh, I really loved it so much. It was a, um, a spiritual journey as much as a geographical one. I, I remember I had been there um, and I had done a re recce reconnaissance trip up in beautiful Ladakh. And uh, was one night I was sitting with my guide you know, slash interpreter talking about things. We talked about, you know, beautiful places and... You know, things that you could dream of doing, but has never, ever been done. And I, so I said, do, do you know about any place? If you could send me someplace and drop me someplace to t that where I could take pictures, that would be very, very unusual. And when we started about take, talking about it, and then we found a place in, in a valley that um, had never been photographed, uh, actually, or hadn't been photographed for many, 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 many years at least. It was in a, in a valley, and I started immediately as I returned back to Sweden to apply for a permission to go there, and it was rejected oh. because, because it was a buffer zone uh, uh, that for military oh, reasons. Yes. yes, 
uh, but also it, it had for many reasons it was impossible. But thanks to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and thanks to uh, the kind help from the ambassador uh, to India in Sweden at that time, uh, 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 Ambassador uh, Chitra Narayana, yes. we managed to get a, a, a green light to do this assignment far, far, far from everything into a world that had been encapsulated in time. It was like a time warp. And I remember uh, Ambassador Narayanan, she made a phone call when I was sitting opposite her in her beautiful office in Stockholm. And she said, I have this photographer uh, opposite me, she said on the phone. And she said, this is, it's a very unusual request I'm having, but I need this photographer to be able to go all the way into. And she said, yeah, I know it's impossible. Uh, yes, I know. Yes, I know. Well, but thank you very much. And she hung up, hung up. And then she said, sometimes it's convenient to have a father that is the president of India. So she, <laughs> she managed through her incredible connections and kind help, uh, help me to get into this remote and absolutely amazing world. So it was one of the most special uh, projects I've ever done. Wonderful. I think, I think apart from your talent, uh, which is just brilliant, um, as I say, the mindfulness that you carry with you in your work and you're so conscious about uh, what you do, um, you're conscious about every little movement, every little leaf, every little, you know, uh, wisp of the air or the smell, uh, which comes from a very trained mind, a meditative mind. Uh, and that's, that's what, what, what you are, at least that's what I perceive uh, you to be. Um, so your last parting uh, uh, thoughts, uh, any message that you would like to sort of impart uh, to the world at large through this medium, really? Well, I, first of all, thank you so much. It has been a joy talking to you. Uh, and uh, I also look forward to reading your book on, on uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I, I can't wait to do that. But mm -hmm. I, also want to, I also want to say that it's, um, it's a time that can be tough on, on all of us, but it's also an incredible opportunity to uh, choose a more uh, holistic, more sustainable and friendly path, uh, more compassionate path. And, uh, and I think that it goes without saying that we need to embark on a new journey that is more sustainable, but that doesn't take away all the pleasures. Uh, it's, uh, sometimes I meet people saying that oh, that's too bad, I have to be more green, I have to be more sustainable, that means I cannot do this, 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 this. It's not true. Today, there are so many alternatives and by being creative and open-minded, and I think that is, again, coming back to the COVID-19 situation, it's really an eye-opener for all of us, is that, yes, it's tough, but life goes on and there are great perks in reflecting on that, cherishing what we have and really taking care of each other and nature that is the prerequisite for our journey ahead. Wonderful, wonderful. Matthias Kulum, thank you so much for this wonderful interaction. Thank and you very much. Hope to see you soon in person. Likewise. And over to you, uh, Sanjoy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Janvi, for that beautiful conversation. Thank you all for watching and being such a lovely audience. Please log back on for our next session, Singing in the Dark, K. Sachidanandan and Nishi Chabla in conversation with Mohini Gupta. <laughs>